So then, um, last talk in this half of the session, then we're going to have a small um, break, is jo uh, Dr. Judy uh, Kleinheinz, the Deputy for ISRU System Capability Leadership for NASA, uh, talking about Envision Future ISRU. And her fact she shared was the fact she has seen every single Pixar movie. And I'm sure that has nothing to do with having a three-year-old. <laughs> All right, so um, I'll be talking. Did I just do that? Um, so I'll be talking about the ISRU and Vision Futures. Um, I'm the deputy lead for the ISRU CLT. Uh, Jerry Sanders, uh, many of you know, is the lead for this team. He's actually in Luxembourg for Luxembourg Space Week this week, um, presenting similar slides there. So in terms of our Envision future, this is kind of the top level. Um, you know, there, there's, you know, the, the goal in the live was to um, enable a vibrant lunar economy with utilities and commodities. And, and of course, ISRU has a clear path of doing that. Um, the first is the commercial scale water, oxygen, and metal production. And the, really the goal here is to start with uh, mapping the lunar resources at a mining scale. Um, and then moving on to the scalable production of these commodities for say propellant or, or um, whatever else you can use those commodities for. So starting with 10 metrics of tons, 10 metric tons say to refuel an initial uh, ascent vehicle, moving into hundreds or thousands per year. Uh, another area is commodities for uh, life support and habitats. This can includes food production. Uh, this could be doing fertilizers or substrates for plant growth. Obviously, if we're going after the water, there's a direct path there as well. Um, and it could even be for things like radiation shielding and so on. The uh, third box there is uh, the feedstock for construction and manufacturing and energy. Uh, we have a lot of ties to this group and Mark's gonna be talking a little later about this stuff, but um, you know, starting with say the raw material, the raw regolith material, uh, building simple landing pads and structures like berms, and then moving into more advanced construction techniques, maybe with binders, maybe uh, building up to, to bigger systems. Again, you'll see a scalability thing here, starting with you know, tens and then hundreds of, of metric tons of materials to enable these capabilities as we expand. The final box there is really using ISRU to support not just surface operations, but the broader architecture, the broader cislunar architecture, and taking that and enabling more missions and, and going further out. So ISRU is massively multidisciplinary, right? I mean, if you look at an end-to-end -end ISRU system, you're starting with excavation, you're moving into chemical processing and extraction, you're doing electrical, electrochemical processes like electrolysis, um, you're doing commodity storage and transfer, um, lots of mobility going on there. And then, you know, the, the huge ties to power that, that John just talked about, um, even going further out into the, you know, uh, navigation and, and communications realm. So if you look at the ISRU system as a whole, it could be huge. So we kind of have to draw a little control volume here <laughs> to what's in our box and then where do we interface out. So usually when we talk ISRU, we're talking about prospect to product. So we're starting with destination reconnaissance and resource assessment. So this is defining what the resource is, but also the environment and what's around. Um, moving into acquisition, isolation, preparation, preparing the raw material for then the extraction of the resource and then the commodity production from that resource. Say you've got water and then you want to split it into H2 and O2 for propellants. The figure here, it, it's a bit busy, but it's meant to show the interconnects um, both in the ISRU system, but to our customers. And that's kind of the key word for ISRU, right? We don't exist on our own. We exist to support a customer, right? So we have to link to these users and find the end users, find what they need, both to design the technologies, design the scale of the system, and design what that commodity needs to look like coming out of our system. This is a, a different representation of the functional breakdown. This is actually uh, from the ICG report, which was an international effort. Um, so, you know, this is kind of showing the different uh, categories that I just talked about, resource assessment, preparation, um, production of the consumables, and then uh, the feedstock, you know, where those last two are kind of in parallel. Um, I do want to highlight that there's this cross-cutting category um, that we kind of bin some other things. 
Um, and, and the things in here are, are good to highlight because it says planetary simulants and uh, regolith and, and vacuum chambers. So obviously ISRU, you know, you have to touch this stuff on the ground. Producing good regolith simulants is key for being able to do that, but other areas are also interested in that. That's why it's so cross-cutting, as well as dirty thermal vac chambers and those kind of test capabilities to enable this. Uh, again, another flow graphic that, that kind of goes into some detail about the interconnects and where we've been these things. Um, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but encourage you once the RFI is released, you'll be able to look over all these slides in, in grand detail. So of course we have to operate as a part of a larger architecture, don't we all? Um, but to maximize the benefit of ISRU, we really have to be in the loop from the beginning, right? You have to be in the architecture, ISRU product usage has to be in mind from the very beginning if you want the maximum benefit. You know, it, it's great to say we'll do it as a block upgrade later. Um, obviously, there, you know, <laughs> that has some problems. Um, so, you know, we want to push to make sure we're in this picture. And this is kind of a breakdown of where we fit in, both as a customer ourselves, ISRU being the customer, as well as ISRU being the supplier of these things. So, you know, as an example, you look at the power, right? Obviously, we are a customer of the power, a big customer of the power but we're also a provider, or we could help provide that, as, as John said, with some of the materials, even just water for fuel cells or something like that. Uh, obviously, transportation is a big part of ISRU, both uh, getting and transporting raw materials as well as the, the uh, commodities that you're producing to your customer. Uh, common nav, obviously maintenance and prepare is a big one, where we're both producing the feedstock to make, say, additively manufactured items that could be replacement parts, parts uh, but being a customer of those replacement parts as well. Um, I've already mentioned commodity storage and distribution. There's heavy links to cryofluid management there, uh, as well as construction and outfitting, which is a common theme you'll be seeing throughout this, and, and I'm sure Mark will be talking about in his uh, presentation later. So just kind of a step to the side here. What are we talking about when we're talking about lunar resources, right? There's a lot of options, um, but for the near term, at least we're looking at number one, the easiest to mine, but also the things that are gonna give you the most bang for your buck, right? So the big one and your big consumable, of course, is propellant. And if you can save the transport of your return propellant, right, from Earth, you're saving a lot of cost um, and, and that's your biggest benefit. So what we're really looking at in the near term is uh, these propellant production resources, which are, of course, water, we've talked about, um, where you get the O2 and H2, or you can use it just as water. But there's, ox um, there's oxygen in the mineral oxides that you can get to directly, where oxygen is the, uh, the driver of your propellant. Most of your propellant is oxygen. The byproduct, and I, I use finger quotes on that, the byproduct is the metals, right, which obviously has a direct path into manufacturing and construction. Uh, as well as the raw regolith material being a resource itself. Um, and you can see in the other list, there, there's a lot of other things to tackle. John even mentioned the silicates and, and using those for PV arrays for the route, uh, polymers, resins, nitrogen for plant growth. You know, these are all in the picture. They're, they're all there. Again, the near term is looking at um, those, those big hitters for the propellant uh, and the manufacturing. I do wanna highlight Lunar regolith obviously is different depending on where you're at on the moon. And uh, that difference impacts your technology that you would use for extraction, but also can impact what you get out of what commodity you're pulling out of that. So um, the mare regolith being more basalt based versus the north acidic uh, highland or polar material, it does impact these processes and impact your products. Okay, so what's our plan to achieve those grand outcomes that I presented earlier? So the first thing, of course, you know, talking heavily about customers is knowing the customer needs. You know, we're working with the Artemis campaign to define the architecture, working with international partners and so on, um, but also working with the folks like life support and those longer term, broader uses. Um, even thinking about things that we initially consider a contaminant and that we need to remove, say for propellant or life support, they can be used for other purposes, right? Uh, so again, looking at this sort of end-to-end, -end, use it all big picture, and understanding who's customer for what. Um, the second bullet is, is really about the technology development, getting the ground demonstration up, raising the TRL, 
looking across that TRL scale and bringing it up for, for all these different technologies. And in that, that's, you know, component to subsystem to system testing, doing the relevant environment testing, doing the gravity related research we need to prove out these uh, concepts and technologies uh, and, and moving that forward. CLIPS is a great opportunity in multiple ways to do risk reduction. So obviously near term, we're talking about resource uh, reconnaissance and, and assessments, uh, things like the Prime One Viper mission and Viper missions, moving that forward, but also obtaining critical knowledge gap data. Um, so this is like the physical properties of the regolith, the environment that we're looking at and getting that information. And then of course, demonstrating these critical technologies where ground tests uh, fail and you can't get all that you need and you really have to go to the lunar surface to test those technologies. And finally is the end-to-end -end demonstration of ISRU. And, and this is really, we're moving towards a flight end-to-end -end demonstration here um, at a sufficient scale. So obviously we're gonna start at subscale, um, but it's gotta be scalable up to the full scale. So it's all well and good if you can pull out a gram of water, <laughs> but is that scalable to getting 15 metric tons of water? Um, so whatever we do, it has to be a representative scale of what we wanna go forward with for our full scale system. And again, that last bullet really highlights it is we have to demonstrate this before mission critical applications, before we're gonna get the buy-in for infusion from the mission, we really have to prove out that ISRE works. Um, this sort of idea that sometimes you can't fly it until you've flown, we gotta check the box and, and really prove out uh, that we can do it. This is sort of big picture uh, the timeline. Um, what you can see in the near term is some of the prospecting or the reconnaissance kind of things. There's some orbital missions that are going to help. And then we've got those two ground demos with the clips, or not ground demos, but the, the uh, prospecting campaigns, the uh, Prime One and, and Viper. While those are going on, busy doing tech development in, in concert with this. So you kind of have to take data as it comes in and adjust as you get it so that we can meet the timeline, looking to uh, demonstrating some ISRU technologies out in the 2026 timeframe, where you can see that we're representing this dual path, this idea that we could either go after the water for the near-term pilot plant, or we can go after the oxygen from the minerals. These are both possible options. We're kind of pursuing a dual path technology development till we get to the point that we're ready to down select for what we're gonna do with the pilot scale. Just to show how this all fits in, so STMD kind of has the stuff on the, the left side, which is they're, uh, they're committed to supporting the tech development for ISRU and taking us to that pilot scale, at which point we'd be handing off to the human mission director at ESDMD to, uh, to take us and infuse into mission. Okay, very busy chart. I'm not gonna spend too much time reading through this. Just to say, this is the state of the art. This is where um, this is where the current work is. And what you can see is we have stuff in all these categories, right? We're busy. <laughs> um, resource assessment, water mining, several concepts, a lot going on in oxygen extraction. Um, a lot of that built up over the constellation days um, as, a, as really a, a foundation for that. Uh, trying to build up the construction feedstock area. And then finally, the cross-cutting I wanted to highlight here, things like the electrolysis pro projects, which are cross-cutting with ECLIS, where we kind of share some of those efforts. Um, you'll see the, the simulant characterization and some of the dirty thermal vac stuff down there. There's a lot going on there. Okay, this is a general list of gaps. Um, so we do have a, a, a broad list of gaps all of it kind of boils down to a couple different key things here. The, the first one is being long-term operation, right? ISRU has got to operate on the order of year or years. Um, so a lot of this equipment's got to operate in extreme environment for long-term, whether that be a PSR, permanently shadowed region, or, or wherever, they are extreme environments. ISRU has to interface with the regolith, which is harsh. And we've got to deal with the handling of the regolith and all of this. And we've got to try to do it autonomously. So long-term, harsh environment, autonomous operations is where most of these gaps are born from. Um, the other key one that you'll see throughout here is the scalability is being a number one concern as well and making sure that what we're doing in the lab and testing out in, in the lower level te 
technology is scalable to the bigger scale. So this is kind of the investment portfolio um, as it is now, just kind of give you an idea, TRLs and timelines. This is for oxygen extraction from the minerals. Um, and what you can see here is a variety of different efforts. We're expecting some, some more efforts here with, with solicitations that are, that are on the street now and coming in. Um, and what you'll see with this compared to the next slide, which is water mining, water mining's obviously shifted a little to the right a little lower TRL because again, with that oxygen production, we did have constellation era programs where we kind of built that up and we had a foundation to stand on where the water mining is newer, that's newer information. Um, so moving forward with those. This is kind of the investment status. Um, so I kind of showed you where we are investing. This is kind of the stoplight chart um, where we're kind of showing where we need work and where we're doing okay, obviously. You know, oxygen uh, extraction, we're, we're doing okay largely, um, building up the resource assessment, though, you know, there's nothing planned after Viper yet. Um, so that sort of campaign to get that, but there are technologies in development for, for various instruments to move that forward for, for, um, for prospecting. Um, manufacturing and construction is an area that we're, we're trying to ramp up. We're trying to contribute to that feedstock production and then again, some of that um, kind of cross-cutting effort with, with the ground test work and the simulants that we need for that. And I, I wanna highlight on here that we do have a lot of industry and academia uh, uh, cooperation at, through all of this, a lot of solicitations. We target for ISRU a lot of work. We, we really value the community's input here um, and, and I hope we're making that clear. And uh, this is the last slide, just kind of going through our next steps and our priorities. The, the first slide's really the uh, just keep swimming kind of thing. Uh, keep doing what we're doing in terms of technology development, um, continue to bring them up and, and pursue that dual path for the technology development for oxygen and, and water mining. Um, ramping up the metal production and, and feedstock and manufacturing is another key thing that we'd, we'd like to focus on going down the road. Uh, coordinating the polar resource assessment. This is really understanding the water, understanding what's there, both in terms of ISRU production, but this also feeds into Artemis and base camp site selection, um, understanding um, the physical properties and, and the environment as well. This, this is cross-cutting with them. Doing the system level integration